Today we're going to talk about steps two and three. Yesterday we talked about step one. We talked about how the powerlessness in the first half of the first step is directly related to the idea that of the physical allergy. How when I put drugs and alcohol in me, my body reacts differently than other people. It produces this phenomenon of craving and it causes a situation where I can't always control how much I drink or use. That the powerless, the powerlessness doesn't mean I can't ever control it, it means I can't always control it. And then we talked about the, the uh, unmanageability in the second half of the first step and how that relates to the mental obsession and not just the chaos in my life. That when, when I make a decision to try and stop drinking and using, I can't manage that decision because this mental obsession comes on me and convinces me it's gonna be different somehow or that I don't even care if it's different, I'm doing it anyway. And then we also talked about that if I believe after looking at my own drinking and using history that I'm an alcoholic or an addict based on history of phenomenon of craving and history of unmanageability, then there are only two possible outcomes to that truth. One is I'm gonna drink and use whether I want to or not until I die probably not anytime soon, doing the best I can to blot out how miserable it is. And the, and the other choice is to actively pursue some sort of program of recovery. There isn't a third choice if you're an actor or an alcoholic. And so today, this takes us to step two, and that this is where the solution begins to be presented. So step, step two says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. There are some basic ideas about spirituality that I want to talk about before we really get into the meat of step two that will help it make more sense in a practical manner. The first idea is that spirituality is not a choice. You have a spiritual nature just like you have a physical nature and a mental nature. It's part of being human. Every human is a spiritual being. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything else. I'm just talking about what it means to be human. And the second thing about Second piece of that is, you have spiritual health just like you have mental health and physical health. You may be in great physical health or terrible physical health, but you have physical health somewhere on a scale. And the same is true of mental and spiritual. I also believe that 12-step recovery is not actually based on a belief in God. It's based on first-hand experience with the effects of this power in my life. You can believe in God all day long, it won't get you sober. You cannot believe in God and it won't keep you from getting sober. As long as you get some first-hand experience with this power. So, so here's another real central idea to understanding the, the practical mechanics of the program and how they affect you and, and how they keep you sober. And this is the idea that my thinking and your thinking and everybody's thinking is based on the spiritual their condition they're in while they're doing the thinking. And then my actions and my emotions are based on my thoughts. You all have some first-hand experience with this even if you don't realize it. How many of you guys have ever done something catastrophically stupid while you were really angry? How many of you are not willing to admit it? <laughs> yeah, that's an example. When I'm really angry, I'm spiritually disconnected. And I'm acting on that spiritual condition, and I do dumb stuff. Like, I always joke, like, I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to take my shirt off and go outside and call the cop a rookie, but I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> it was a good way to get beaten to a pulp is what happened. Yeah. You know, I'm not even sure what the sheetrock did, but it needed punching. <laughs> you know, dumb stuff. So we have some experience with this model. You know, I'm not one to take things on face value. I want to understand something if, it's, if I'm able to understand it. And understanding this idea is central to seeing how the steps help me address this truth. So once again, I like to visualize things. The only good way to talk about spiritual concepts is through analogy. And I like pictures, because I'm simple like that. But, but also, Humans have a very developed visual cortex. Once we see something, we'll remember it. So this is the thing that I've come up with that I like. The spiritual gas gauge. For those of you under 30, this is an analog gas gauge. <laughs> you may never have seen one. This is what they look like. When the gauge is on full, and I'm spiritually connected, 
I feel comfortable in my skin. My thinking is clear. My actions are effective. My emotions are in proper um, proportion to what's happening to me. And this isn't a place you get and stay. This just, spiritually fit mostly just means that where I am spiritually, I feel like I can meet the demands of my life as it is right now without being afraid. I feel, you know, I'm sitting in my comfort zone and it's good. That can change with a phone call. But when I'm spiritually fit, I feel good, life is good. Oh, by the way, I have no need to get high because I already feel great. But on a good day with nothing going wrong, the tank begins to drain. And when I get to a three quarters of a tank, my thinking becomes selfish and self-centered and dishonest and fear-based. My thinking's based on my spiritual condition. And as it diminishes, my thinking becomes full of those character defects. And if I don't do anything about it, the tank continues to drain and I hit half a tank and now my actions are selfish and self-centered and dishonest and fear-based, inescapably. And if I don't do anything about that, the tank continues to drain, I hit a quarter tank and the mental obsession returns. Because the mental obsession is just a kind of thought. It's an insane thought based on poor spiritual condition. A relapse is not hiding in the bushes waiting to jump out at me. It's not stuck in a drawer and I didn't know it was there and I opened the drawer and the next thing I knew I was high. That's not how it works. Relapse, the act of starting to drink and use again, is the last step in a process of becoming more and more and more spiritually unfit. While I'm down there below a quarter of a tank, I'm going to drink and use whether I want to or not. That's just the truth of the model. All of us have things in our past that we're, that we're ashamed of, that we wish were different. But if you believe that your thinking is based on your spiritual condition and your actions are based on your thinking, then what you did, that stuff you did, that stuff I did, that I wish I could take back, were, those are the inevitable actions of a person in that spiritual condition. You might have known better, but you couldn't do better. You know, I mean, I always joke, I know what it looks like to dunk a basketball, but that's not happening. You know, just because I know what it looks like doesn't mean I can do it. I knew what it looked like to be a good man. I had had it modeled for me growing up. But I couldn't do it when push came to shove. And that's the soul-crushing, mind-destroying piece of addiction is like, I know what it looks like to do right, and I can't seem to do it. And I start wondering what's wrong with me. This is what's wrong with me. Spiritual condition I'm in is driving me to behavior I don't even know how to think about. So in the book, page 44, it says, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us no matter how hard we tried. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourselves which will solve your problem. Notice that it doesn't say, the object of the book is to help you find a power greater than yourself that will help you solve your problem. So I find a connection to a higher power and the problem is solved. The tank is full. And I don't have a problem to solve anymore and I don't need to get high and the obsession is lifted. So I want to break step two down a little bit. First it says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, not came to believe in a power greater than ourselves. It's presupposing that there's some power greater than me. My first shot at step two in, in treatment was two weeks of arguing about whether or not God existed with other people in a rehab. The big book says God either is or he isn't. I figured I should make up my mind so that the churches knew how to proceed. But, uh, but that's not really what we're asking here. I know that there are powers greater than me. Heroin was a power greater than me. APD was a power greater than me. There are powers greater than me. What I'm doing is, I'm coming to believe that a power greater than me can restore me to sanity. Now, you'll hear all kinds of nonsense in 12-step meetings about people who are still waiting to be restored. I'm waiting to be restored. <laughs> or how can I be restored to something I never had because I'm a unique, special flower? <laughs> but the sanity that the second step is talking about isn't all the crazy stuff I do. 
or even the crazy thoughts I have. The sanity we're talking about in the second step is based on the insanity of the first drink. The big book uses the word insanity 47 times in the first 164 pages. And every single time, it's the insanity of the first drink. On page 8, it says, trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of the first drink, and on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. And on page 66, it says, when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again, over and over, the insanity of the first drink. So this, what I'm being restored from is the insanity of the first drink. Am I willing to believe that a power greater than me can remove the mental obsession and keep me away from that first drink. Because the fact that I have an allergy, that when I put it in me, my body reacts differently, would be a, it, that would be a moot point if I just didn't put it in me. But I can't not put it in me. And I'm allergic to wheat. If I eat wheat, my lungs swell shut and I can't breathe. But I've never once found myself weeping in a corner eating the brownie anyway, even though I didn't want to. But I've totally been that guy with drugs and alcohol. You know, if I could just not put it in me, I will just not put it in me and go about my business without having to talk with all you good people all the time. But I can't do that. So I'm coming to believe that a power greater than myself can do that for me. How that works for most of us has to do with this idea that in the 12-step world we call identification. One alcoholic talking to another. For me, I landed at the treatment center that, where I got sober, and it was a, you know, it felt like middle school for me. You know, I was on a charity bed at an expensive treatment center. I felt different, you know. But there was a guy that worked there named Ray, and Ray was covered in tattoos. He was an old biker, an old meth cook. The main difference in me and Ray is he got caught and spent time in prison, and I didn't get caught. But that was really the only difference in us. But by the time I met Ray, he was 10 years sober. And he sat down with me, and he helped me look at my experience around the first step and really get clear on whether or not I believed I was an act and an alcoholic. And he told me his story. And you know when somebody's speaking from experience that you share with them, how familiar it sounds? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody who was pretending to know about something you know about? You know, it's like talking to a seventh grader about sex. <laughs> they haven't done it yet, they don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but when Ray talks, it was, he was telling my story. But he'd been sober 10 years. And he looked me square in the eye and said, do you think I'm just better at not getting high than you? And I had to stop and think about it for a minute. And I told him, no. He said, why? I said, because I see you laughing all the time. And just not getting high is not funny. <laughs> and he went, right. I'm telling you that a power has entered into my life and completely removed that obsession. I have not had to make that decision. I have not fought that battle for 10 years. Do you, and so I came to believe Ray. The God thing was still freaking me out. But I came to believe Ray. And once I believed Ray, I began to have faith in the process. And so that's where the second step began to make a turn for me, was having identified with the people who were in front of me on the path. You can't talk about not just how, how I drank and used, but what it felt to, like to be me while I was stuck in that process. That's the important bit. You can't talk about that unless you've been there. So people who are happy and on the other side of that, I think, well, maybe. If we're alike, maybe I can do what they're doing. Maybe I can have faith in them. And so that, that leads, to, leads to three really simple practical questions about step two. The first one is, are you currently experiencing the mental obsession? Right here, right now, are any of you currently experiencing the mental obsession? And that's not, well, I'm a little uncomfortable and it would be nice to have a bug. That's, I'm willing to leave my crap locked up in the contraband office and walk my hush puppies back to Austin to get some dope. So if you're not experiencing that at, the, at this moment, the second question is, did anything you ever do make that go away for any length of time besides being high? And for me, the answer was no. 
It never stayed gone for long. And then the third question becomes, am I willing to believe that the reason it's gone is because a power greater than myself is already acting in my life? Credit where credit's due. Because like I said, the program's built on first-hand experience with the effects of this power in my life. And that right there is a handy bit of first-hand experience to start with. And it doesn't say I firmly believe. It says I'm coming to believe. When Ray told me that's what was going on with him, I went, okay, well, maybe that's why I've been here a week and I don't want to kill myself. And I'm not willing to walk into Kerrville to try and find heroin. So I'm coming to believe. It's a process. So like I said, the 12-step recovery is not based on a belief in God. It's based on first-hand experience. Once again, I don't like to take things on, on a just on faith if I don't have to. And so I want to understand what's happening. I wanted to understand how I ended up sitting where you're sitting without the monkey on my back. So this is the way to think about it. I'm cruising along and I'm spiritually unfit and my tank is empty and I'm getting high and the obsession's all over me and I can't stop no matter what I do. And I'm spending all my time trying to figure out how to stop. And then I give up. And I, I, I stop trying to solve the problem myself, and I become willing to go try and find some help. Become willing to try something different. And when I do that, the needle moves to here. It's not much, but it's above the line where the obsession exists. For you guys, the willingness to come here, even if it wasn't your idea and you don't like the idea, you came. And the willingness to come opens a space. It lets a little bit of ego out of the way. I don't think of it as ego. I think of it as trying to save my own life. But a little, moves a little bit of ego out of the way, and a little bit of this power comes in, and the obsession gets lifted. And I'm just not fighting that fight. I'm fighting all kinds of other fights, but I'm not having that one going on right now. The point of the rest of the steps, this is grace. This was an accident. The point of the rest of the steps is to allow me to increase my contact with this power and fill the tank up so I can be comfortable in my skin and happy and productive. And, oh, and sober too. You know, sober is just the first thing that happens when I get connected. So, that you, so your willingness to try something new and just come here has brought you this time out without having to fight the fight of whether or not I'm going to get high today so that you can start learning the mechanics of the steps you need to take so that you don't ever have to get high again. There's an old timer in Dallas who likes to say, the steps do for me slowly what a shot of dope and a bottle of whiskey do for me quickly. My job is to be patient and persistent. I promise you, I'm not just better at not getting high than you. I promise you. I haven't fought that fight in a meaningful way in, in 19 years. I still can't believe it. This isn't sitting in a church pew somewhere hoping God likes me. That's not what we're doing here. We're taking specific actions that by their nature connect us to this power. But it starts with coming to believe that that's the solution and that's what step two is about. And then that takes us to step three which has made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God's as we understood him. So I love this. I like to look up words. And recently, I looked up the word decision. The word decision is to select a course of action to make a final choice or judgment about something. So how do I know I've made a decision? There's action based on it. Everybody knows that. Three frogs sitting on a log and one of them decides to jump in the river. How many frogs are on the log? Three till you hear a splash. It's just an idea until I act, then it's a decision. So in the big book, it says, being convinced, we were at step three. So convinced of what? Well, just before that, it says, A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could relieve our alcoholism. And C, that God couldn't what if you were sought. So if I'm convinced of those things, I'm at step three. I believe I'm an alcoholic, and I believe that there's a spiritual solution to, to this problem. On page 60, it says, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. 
Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Which begs the question, why am I living on self-will? Why am I doing it? Why am I running around out there trying to control everything around me and get my way? The fundamental reason is because I believe that if I can just get everything out here right, if you would just act right, and the money would show up when it's supposed to, and the car would never break, and I, didn't, and I don't have to pay rent this month, and if I could get everything out here right, then I'd be okay. Has that ever worked? Like, not just for like a minute or two, but I mean, in a sustainable manner, has it ever worked? And yet, when it doesn't work, we redouble our efforts because it freaks us out that it didn't work. Because we really believe that it's up to us. The book says that I'm living with a delusion that I can wrestle satisfaction and happiness out of the world if I just manage well. But satisfaction and happiness don't come out of the world, no matter how much I manage. In the big book on page 62, it says, Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past we've made decisions based on self, which later put ourselves in a position to be hurt. So I'm running out there trying to get everything I need, and if part, you've got part of that, well, you're going to have to give it to me. And if you won't give it to me, then I'll just take it. And then I won't understand why you keep talking bad about me to everybody. So what's the solution to this problem? Self-will is not a solution. It's not working. If it was working, you wouldn't be stuck here listening to me. On page 62, it goes on to say, first of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. That always confused me. What is playing God? I, I get a, I'm dressing up like Thor and hanging out by the soda machine. You know, what is, I don't, what is playing God? Right. It's, it's thinking that I can fix what's wrong with me spiritually by managing the world well. But that's not where the answer comes from. You know, it's not in the nature of the human animal to produce spiritual power. We don't produce it, we tune it. You know, it's, it's not a flaw in us that we don't produce this power. I always talk about, I spent 10 or 12 years as a graphic designer and web developer and animator and video editor, and I've got this incredibly powerful workstation computer at home. It's capable of phenomenal pieces of creative work. But the one thing that computer will never make is electricity. And without electricity, it's a $4,000 paperweight. The other picture I like, the analogy I like, is one of a radio. Radios don't make music. They tune a signal that's already out there. Radio has solid electronics, a good mind, and a solid case, a good body. But it's not in the nature of the radio to make the music. It's supposed to tune the music. But if it's not on the channel, it's just blasting static. And this is me my whole life, just walking around. <laughs> and then once in a while, I'll hit a spot and oh, music will come out. And I'll go, that was awesome. How did that happen? What just, I was smoking and you were sitting there and it was a Thursday and the sun was in, I, and I can't reproduce it because I don't know why it happened. Turns out that the reason it happened was because for unknown reasons, me and my buddies were all being unselfish, and God showed up. So, but I don't know where it's coming from, right? So I keep trying to reproduce it. My job is, the, is not to make the spiritual energy, it's to tune it, just like the radio. And you know, if you're like me, you're a radio with a broken antenna. It's harder to tune than it is for other people. You know, I lived in L.A. for a long time during the middle of the crack epidemic. Nobody had an antenna on their car because back then they were all hollow. <laughs> the crackheads are snapping them off a mile a minute. <laughs> but <laughs> so I like you constantly got to play with the dial, right? Because it keeps shifting off the station. I got to constantly play with the dial. But that's my job. That's the, what the steps do for me. That's what I'm deciding. I'm deciding that there is music and then I'm going to have to work to tune it. That's what I'm deciding in step three. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He's the principal, we're his agents. Most ideas are simple, and this concept was a keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we marched to freedom. 
So step three is a decision to act like a man or a woman of faith instead of a man and a woman or a woman who's driven by fear and character defects. That's the simplest version. I may not know what a person of faith looks like, but I, can, I got the fourth step to look at my fear and my character defects. So I'm turning my, my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions, over to the care of God as I understand him. This is a challenging prospect. Like when I first heard this, I'm going like, if I do that, I'm definitely going to have to sell my records. Because there's no way that I can turn my life over to God and listen to the kind of music I like. You know? And I, I'm, I, I'm trying to make this decision, but I don't know what the decision means. So that word care hangs me up. I have a buddy. This was great. He's about four years older than me. And he got sober. He was 58 years old when he got sober. And Ten months into his sobriety, his son brought his two grandsons over for him to watch for the very first time. Like he had met them. They were six and seven years old, but they were never allowed to be alone with granddad because that wasn't safe. And they brought, they brought the kids over. And they're running around the backyard being completely insane like six and seven-year-old boys are. And every once in a while, he would stop and go, get off of the roof, climb, no, climb, no, don't jump, climb back down. You know, put the lawnmower, put it back in the shed, you don't need the lawnmower. You know, stop chasing your brother with a stick, you know. Like, and after an hour or so of this, he realized that his grandsons had been turned over to his care. He wasn't trying to control them. He wasn't trying to make them be anybody but who they are. But every once in a while, they would do things that put themselves at risk, and he would pull them back and redirect them. And that's a great model of care. When I first heard the step, I was thinking, I was hearing control. Turn my will and my life over to the control of God, and that freaked me out. I'm never going to be a religious person. I'm never going to go to church. If you do, that's great. It's never going to be me. What does this mean? But care, somebody that look, can look after me. You know, and how it works is I get to do whatever I want. And when I start moving off the path, God keeps raising the stakes till he gets my attention because it hurts and it feel, makes me feel crummy. And then I can do some work and head back over to the path. So the word care is defined as the provision of what's necessary for health, welfare, maintenance, and protection of someone or something. So I'm turning my will and my life over to God for the provision of what's necessary for my health, welfare, maintenance, and protection. That sounds like a good idea. Even if God makes me uncomfortable, the rest of it sounds awesome. You know, please somebody look after me. And through the book, there are all kinds of examples of what executing the third step looked like. On page 86... On page 86, it says, in thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine to which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we've tried this for a while. That's a specific set of instructions on how to turn my will and my life over to God in the moment when I'm facing indecision. This is the kind of practical instructions the program gives me. So the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. This is the first prayer that I completely and utterly balked at <laughs> because of the 18th century language and the these and the thys. It feels real churchy. You know? But what it says is awesome. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you see fit. Here I am, make me into who I'm supposed to be. Give me the power to be who I'm supposed to be. Fully who I'm supposed to be. Not just get by, but to fully exploit all of the talents and gifts I've been given for the benefit of myself and the world. Give me that power. Not just sober, big cool life. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. 
which my sponsor says means help me pull my head out so I can hear your instructions without them being so muffly. You know, relieve me of the bondage of self. And, and, you know, there's two ways to go about that. Either I can start actively trying to pursue a connection to God and intuitive thinking, or I can act on self, have it go badly, do inventory, and then try again next time. Happily, there's two versions, because I'm going to do both. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them, blah, blah, blah. Mostly take away my difficulties, right? I'll bear witness. I'll tell people it was you. And in the beginning, I thought that meant it was like a finding Nemo. Don't let anything ever happen to me. But if nothing happens to me, nothing happens to me. What it really means is taking away my difficulties means give me the power to walk through the challenges in life. Because I didn't have that power when I got here. The only power I had was out. Something shows up, I'm out. I evade it. I don't ever go through it. I just disappear. I don't pay the bill. I don't deal with the situation. I don't whatever. IRS been sending me mail for seven years. When I sobered up, I owed them $71,000. There was no out. I was going to die. That was the only out. You know? But uh, as, I, as I turn my will and my life over, I'm, I'm given the power to go through the difficulties. With God's help, I go through. And then I know from first-hand experience that I can go through with God's help. And then they're not as scary. They're not as difficult next time. All kind of stuff scared me in early sobriety. The dishes scared me. Leaving the house scared me. You know, I hadn't been leaving the house a lot. But I was able to trust God and take action. And that stopped scaring me. And then I was able to get a job. And that scared me. And then I went there for a while and trusted God and did what they asked me to do. And then that didn't scare me anymore. And, and on and on. And that's what this is giving me. So the third step is a decision to turn my thoughts and my actions over to the care of God. In practical terms, I'm deciding to follow God's direction as it's revealed through the steps. Not just as I make it up in my head, but as it's revealed through the inventory process in steps six and seven, and by talking to my sponsor and through prayer and meditation. All of these steps are there to help me get a clearer vision of what it's like to show up and be the man I'm supposed to be. Help, help me act like a person of faith until I have enough experience to not be afraid of whatever's being asked of me. So the first, like I said earlier, the way you know that, there's a, that you've made the decision is you're taking an action. So the first action based on the third step is you start writing step four. And step four is just an examination of all the ways I don't do three. That's what it is. You know, in pr and in practical terms, it looks like this. So I'm cruising along. I'm feeling pretty good. Life's going well. And then something happens. Something scares me. Somebody does something, piss me off. And I get a resentment. I get a fear. And it diminishes me spiritually. And then my thinking becomes driven by character defects. My thinking becomes selfish and self-centered and dishonest and fear-based. And if I don't do anything, then my actions follow suit. And when my actions don't make things better, it makes me in even worse spiritual condition. And it just continues down and down and down. The beauty of the program of recovery is I don't have to think of it. Because what's the likelihood I'm going to think of the right solution when I'm spiritually unfit? None. You know, think about this. How many of you guys ever made plans to get sober once you were high? Why do you think we waited until we were high to make plans to get sober or to go to the grocery store or whatever? Because solving the problem of me is number one on the to-do list all day, every day. It's hard to be Chris, untreated. It's hard to be us. We're irritable, we're restless, we're discontent. There's not a comfortable place to sit and just be us until I'm high. And once I fix that, then we can clean the house or do whatever. You know? But when I'm in that spiritual condition, when my thinking is selfish and self-centered and dishonest and frightened and I need to fix that, what are the chances I'm going to come up with a new system that's going to allow me to fix that? Like Einstein says, you can't solve a problem with the thinking that created it. 
You know, once I'm spiritually unfit, I'm not going to come up with a great way to become not spiritually unfit. But the beauty of the steps is I don't have to think of them. They're already thought of. I just have to do them. And so once I recognize that my thinking is off or that my actions are off, I can step aside and take the actions of the program and by their nature, they reconnect me to a higher power and fill the tank up again and I get to move back to a place of comfort. That's the point of the steps is once I move off, and I will, I always do, everybody does, I can take these steps and and get back to that ease and comfort that I need because nobody, st- nobody stays sober for long if they're miserable. You know, we have good days, we have bad days. But if I'm just living in the gray and everything kind of sucks, that, that's not sustainable. But I can take the steps and return to a place of comfort where it's easier to be me by having a stronger spiritual connection. So in the program, in that how it works thing they always read at meetings, it says we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. But if I don't know what perfection looks like, how do I gauge progress? You know? I want to go to Dallas. So I go outside and I get in my car and I drive for three and a half hours. Am I in Dallas? Not without a map. I can still be in the parking lot. Three and a half hours. <laughs> Done it. You know? <laughs> you know? How do I get back here again? <laughs> this is a long day. But if I have a map and I know where I'm going, then I can gauge my progress. You know, I hear people in meetings all the time claiming spiritual progress as a way to sound spiritual without actually making progress. There, the book is full of examples of perfection. Those ninth step promises, the tenth step promises, all the way through the book there's examples of what the perfection looks like. But for me, the ultimate perfection that I'm trying to progress towards is the perfect execution of the third step. Because if I'm in perfect alignment with God's will all the time, I'm at perfect peace and ease. And that's all I've ever cared about. All the drugs and alcohol I did, all the women I chased, all the success I tried to have, the money, all of it was in large part an attempt to just have some ease and comfort. You know, when beer wouldn't do it anymore, it became beer and meth. When beer and meth wouldn't do it anymore, it became heroin. You know. All I want is to be a, the ability to just be me and have that not be hard. And when I'm in the perfect, if I can perfectly align myself with the third step, I'll always have that ease and comfort. Now, is that doable? Probably not, but I can get better at it. Steps four and five, like I said, are an examination of all the ways I don't do three. How I act based on self and fear and character defects. In step six, I get to look at what it would have looked like to be a man of faith instead of the crap I just pulled. What would it look like to be unselfish instead of selfish and God-seeking instead of self-seeking and courageous and honest and realistic and considerate? What would that man look like in this situation? And then in step seven, I get to ask my higher power to help me be that man next time because life happens over and over and over. And next time this sort of thing happens, I want to have a plan for handling it so I can show up and begin to grow spiritually so it's not so challenging all the time. Steps eight and nine help me clean up the messes that I made by not doing three because I've never once had to make an amends for doing God's will. In step 10, I get to stay current because step 10 and steps four through nine every time something comes up all day long. Step 11, I get to improve my conscious contact with God so I'm better able to have the intuitive thought. I'm better able to recognize when I don't know what I'm doing so I can pause. And in step 12, I get to channel the power I'm connecting to instead of just collecting it for me so that I've got more than I need on any given day. And it all feeds me back to step three. You know, it, it's, a, it's always a work in progress. You know, the question isn't, am I perfect? The question is, am I better than I was yesterday and last week and last month and last year and five years ago and 10 years ago? You know, you're already making progress, all of you. Even if you're not entirely comfortable with the language yet, you're trying. And just the act of trying is making a start on step three. You know, this is an ongoing process. I, keep, I still do inventory every day so I, can still, so I can be better at life. Because I don't want it to keep freaking me out. I got stuff to do. You know, I can't afford to be freaked out and, fr- and angry all the time because I got stuff to do. I'm trying to be happy. So I do the inventory so I can get that stuff over with. 
This is why I put so much emphasis on inventory when you're here, because it's how I get, it's knowing how to do the inventory allows me to get to this place where I can get a vision of God's will so I can know what it is I'm trying to pull off next time. And so I know what it looks like to execute the third step in a situation the next time it comes up. And that's all we got, guys. Thanks. Thanks.